All right, welcome back, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone have a good first week so far? Surprises? Dismissed? No. Let's see. Anyone interesting going on? Are you drafting leagues? Do you have, like, a school league? We're trying to make one. Uh, well, I got I got something better than fancy football. Anyone ever here? Anyone ever a fancy SCOTUS? Okay, I I invented it. So it's actually it's a quarter of fantasy. Vic, don't laugh. How the justices will vote? We're now in our fifth year. Over twenty thousand people playing, and this year we're actually sponsored by Thomson Reuters. What will be sponsoring it? So you can like the tenth justice, and you can predict the cases. Much more fun than fancy football. So if you are taking com ball. Consider signing up when it starts in October, okay? Free. <laughs> Free. No buy-in. Prizes if you win, though. Uh, oh. Grand prize, $10,000. Oh. We got to be some really smart people, though. I mean, like, really nerdy. What's that? Oh, I don't know if he's going to be playing. Do you have Randy for a con law? Yeah. Uh, we'll see. I don't know if Professor Castle will play, perhaps. But, uh, so, it's a good league. Anyway. All right, so um, I passed around a sign-in sheet. Everyone good. If it doesn't get to you, just come afterwards and sign it. You don't need to start leaping over people to try and get in the middle of class. It's not too important. Uh, I, I'm not doing this, uh, the seating chart today because sometimes we're last-minute ad drops. But I'll do the seating chart on Monday so you have a little bit more time to finalize your seats. So I'm still going to have to call on your name and ask what your name is, but we'll have this settled by uh, hopefully by Monday. Okay? All right. Any questions from the material we covered last time with... Johnson v. McIntosh, or the Indians, or, uh, or or hunting, or dem sets, or any of that stuff. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Kind of a question, but it kind of came up with, what happened to the Indians that were converted to Christianity? Ah. Were they still Indians then? Yeah. Well, 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 I mean, well no, no, no. Ah. <laughs> well, well, at that point, they have already been, their land would have been taken away, right? Right. And if they became Christians, that's wonderful. They're Christians, but the land was already taken away. So in other words, in, in the event that some of the natives converted to Christianity, they didn't get their land back. That's what you're getting at. Yeah, that, that didn't like retroactively give them like a property right. They already lost as heathens. But 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 now they're with Christ, so now they can be uh, uh, accepted to the uh, you know to, to the realm of civilized people or something like that. Okay. Okay. I, I joke, but uh, this is effectively the language that was used back then. So I'm being somewhat facetious, but not really. Other questions? All right, let's get started. So the first, you know, week and a half of property law is probably not what you thought it was going to be, right? No. You thought it was going to be like real estate law and, you know, houses and buying and selling. No. We talk about conquering Indians, hunting whales, and duck hunting, right? That, that's what you say your first week of property law. But I think there's a reason why we start with these really, really simple basic cases. Because in each of these cases we cover, there's no law governing it, right? There are no statutes. There are no cases. Remember we discussed uh, last, last time with the Johnson case? We are basing our ruling on what we might call first principles, right? And you might study first principles in other classes, perhaps nowhere quite as clearly. We are discussing issues of fairness, issues of policy. How can judges decide cases when there's not a statute controlling them? There's not a restatement or a UCC or precedent, right? And that's why we start with these really basic cases about uh, hunting whales and hunting ducks. And you'll do another case on Monday with hunting foxes, right? All these wild animals are about acquiring property when there's no law governing who gets what. That's the underlying theme for the first week and a half of this class. How do judges decide cases? And you might say, well, why is this relevant? You know, today we have statutes where if you steal my duck or you steal my bird or you steal my fox, I can do something under the law. By the time of these cases we decided, we didn't have that. This gets you into the mindset by thinking on property rights on a blank slate, right? How to issue, how to decide these issues very clearly. So the first case uh, uh, is actually a decent segue. So we're talking first about the whale case. And with the Indian case last week, we talked about doctrines of conquest, right? Doctrines of discovery, right? But at the heart of all that stuff about uh, 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 conquest and discovery, there was a basic idea. Whichever European power got there first wins, right? 
Remember there was that discussion, well, the French got here first, they got this colony, right? And the Spaniards got here, so they got this area. There's this idea in law, which is very common, not just property, which is often called first in time, first in right. You get there first, you get to keep it. And it's a little difficult to discuss this in the context of the Indians because, well, clearly, the Indians were there first, right? The Europeans did not get there first. They pretended they did by calling them savages, but they weren't there first. But when we're dealing with animals, and you're hunting in the wilderness, you're hunting whales, you're hunting ducks, you're hunting foxes, you can be the first one there. So the cases we do today and next week look at two different issues, right? Do we give it to the person who's first in time, first in right? What might be called the rule of capture? That is, who gets there first, who captures it first? Or do we reward uh, labor, right? We reward the person who invests the time in the hunt, risks his life, his limb, etc., to get the whale. And these are often competing goals, right? Now, if it happens to be that the person who put all the work into it also got there first, there's no court case, right? If I work my butt off to catch a whale and I get it, there's no legal issue. I got it. The issue arises, and this is what the cases are about today, when two different people make these arguments. The person who caught it and the person who invested the labor, or, or we talked about Locke last week, the person who uses Lockean labor, who mixes his labor with the pursuit. So a lot of the cases we decide try to resolve this issue. They try to thread this needle. Should courts reward someone who actually gets the body first? Or should courts reward the person who puts more effort and more work and more labor into the pursuit? Everyone get that? Any questions, uh, generally speaking? All right, we'll, we'll tease this issue out uh, because it, it highlights something we call efficiency, fairness, certainty. These are all common law issues that the courts had to, had to deal with. All right, so first, let's, let's talk about whales. Any questions before we move on? Anything? Okay, let's talk about whales. Uh, has anyone ever gotten, gotten whale watching? Did you see any whales? Did you? I didn't. Uh, they have these boats like in San Diego. Where'd you do it? Do you remember? Boston. Oh, Boston. You saw whales in Boston? Wow. So I once did it in San Diego. All I got was nauseous. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't see any actual whales. But at one point outside of Massachusetts, there were lots and lots and lots of whales. Um, so to give you a, a, a scale of how, oh, no pun intended, of how big a finback whale is, um, they're huge. Um, these are huge beasts uh, that, that run through the water. Um, they're on average 90 feet long. They weigh roughly the weight of 70 tons, which is about 10 African elephants. These are really big animals. Okay? And as you can imagine, hunting them is very difficult. Did anyone ever read Moby Dick at any point in your high school career? Okay, a couple people. This is dangerous work, okay? The reason why it's dangerous is that unlike hunting a fox or a duck or something, you can't bag it, right? You can't take it with you, all right? So let's start. What did I finish last time? Somewhere here-ish? Uh, right here. What's your name, sir? Matthew. Matthew, okay, let's do a start there. I don't always remember where I finished, but I, everyone will get called on eventually, so if I don't take one around. Oh, no, was I there? No. Yeah. No, it's here, okay. No, all right. No. All right, all right. So Matthew, tell me, uh, what was the method by which the um, the whalers had to hunt these these huge these huge animals? Arrow thingy. Arrow thingy. What's that thing called? Harpoon. Yeah, a harpoon. Okay. And then and then what happened after the harpoon struck the beast? Uh, the whale must die and sink it for sure. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. So there was no way of actually. Oh, by the way, does everyone know why they kill these whales? And what do you get from blubber? Oil. Okay. This is before we discovered oil as a means of like refining from the ground. So for a long time, the only way of getting oil was actually by killing whales. So remarkably, if any of you guys know oil and gas stuff, this whale weighed 70 tons. Try and guess how many barrels you can take from 70 tons of blubber. 
what? 20 barrels of oil. So from this, ent from this entire, so basically from 70 tons, you get 20 barrels of oil. So roughly, I mean, this is not a very efficient way of making oil. And what's interesting is after the introduction of kerosene, not many years afterwards, the whale trade dried up very quickly. They, they didn't hunt nearly as much. Well, how much of that 70 tons is, is that? Right, they have to take out, they have to remove the blubber from the, from the whale. So it's a very inefficient means of getting energy. Yeah, so basically you have to kill a huge animal to get a very small amount of blubber to even have a smaller amount of actually oil that can be retrieved from it. Okay? So, not a very efficient method of getting energy, but the way to kill it was they use harpoons. And initially they used probably the harpoon you think of, which is just like a spear, and they threw it. Oh, I think I have a picture somewhere. Uh, and they, 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 they pray for their lives that they, that they strike it. Sorry, I scrolled down too far. Oh, yeah. So, so this, this is the picture which shows what a whale hunt looks like, right? You can see in the background, the whale's tail flipped this boat in half, and they're in the air. And see their little spears, they're holding it. And this guy is trying to shoot a harpoon into the whale. Uh, not very efficient. Oh, this is what a capture whale looks like. Okay? So an invention was created which makes it a little bit easier. This thing called a bomb lance. So if you imagine having a, a, a rifle, but instead of putting a bullet inside, you put a spear. Okay? That's what a bomb lance was. They had these explosives uh, attached to these spears which would propel the harpoon, hopefully through the air and the water, and make it strike with this sharp point, or this sharp point, into the whale's blubber. Some pictures of what they looked like. Okay? Now, this, is a re this, this one's really serious. It has like, all these like, apparatuses on it. Okay? Now, this was not a very efficient means of hunting, right? Right? So, what's your name? Yeah. Floor. Why was this not an efficient means of hunting? What, what was the danger of uh, hunters using this method? What, what, what could happen? Yeah, exactly. When you shoot the whale, you can't, you know, like a fish, you can't reel it in. Two things can happen, right? It could sink to the bottom of the ocean, maybe it could wash away, or maybe the shore and the tide will bring it in, right? But none of this happens right away. When you shoot the animal, you're basically hoping and praying that at some point it will wash ashore, okay? If it goes out to sea, it's gone. And ma'am, what's your name? Maria. Maria. Now, here comes, here comes the fun part. What happens when it washes ashore? Okay. So you should preface your answer with hopefully that happens, right? <laughs> right. But why, why would someone who sees a whale wash ashore go ahead and call someone to try and figure out the ownership of the whale? Um, because they know that, I think it's just a swimming whale. Ah, tell me more. And, and so they know that once it's that person trusts them, mm. they're, they all have to Okay, very good. Okay, so this was effective like branding. Right? Remember we talked about branding in class last week where each farm has their own brand and if you see a certain mark on a, on a cow's butt, you know which brand it belongs to, right? Same here. Each harpoon had a special marking on it, right? So if a harpoon struck a whale, it would make a specific mark on it. Now, this mark might be buried deep inside the blubber. I have, I have absolutely no idea how difficult it was to retrieve the brand, but let's say, you know, they, they found the brand. At that point, Hopefully, the person who finds it would say, "Oh yeah, I recognize this brand. This is, you know, Mr. Mr. Gen's, uh, you know, harpoon lance, right?" So, what's your name? Jesse. Jesse. What happens then? Uh, they would report it uh, as as they found it. Um, okay. And uh, whoever whoever's harpoon is, um, whoever's brand, they would come and collect it, and they would receive maybe a, a nominal fee. Good. Okay, so what, here's what's supposed to happen, right? What's supposed to happen. The honest person, you know, strolling around the beach, goes, oh, wow, there's a beach whale. Let me go tear through its blubber and try and find the harpoon brand, right? They find the harpoon brand. It's like, oh, yeah, this is, this is Jimmy's brand. Let me go call him. Jimmy shows up and says, oh, yeah, that's my whale. They take it. They dry it out. They take out all the oil. And then the, the finder gets a, gets a fee of some sort, right? 
Okay, that's how it's supposed to happen. And what's your name? Alex. Alex. Why, why would a person walking along the beach do that? Why wouldn't he just keep it from him, keep the entire amount instead of taking this nominal fee? Fine. Yeah, what, I mean, we're all selfish, maximizing individuals. Why would, why would someone walking along the beach do this? I mean, what are the odds anyone will ever find out? Well, first, give me the reason why someone would do this. No, no law. There's no law here. Um, if you knew you'd get in trouble. How do you get in trouble if there's no law? Somebody call him. And, and then what? Ah. So, here, this is the issue. I think Alex ran to the issue, right? What I said at the beginning of class. There's no law here, right? There's no statute under Massachusetts law that says if you find a whale, you're required to go call the owner. What's your name? Kareem. Kareem? Kareem. 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 What? Oh, Areeb. Areeb. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have the names yet. Areeb. Why, why would someone, there's no law, there's no statute. History. Like what, what do you mean history? It's like kind of like the trade, like everyone, it's kind of common knowledge at that time that if you find it and it's branded, <clears throat> So you harpoons, then you know to call, because that's what they've been doing for years. Why are people bound by history? Well, that's, that's uh, what we looked at, since there's no law. Ah. Remember I told you history is relevant? I think that's a good answer. But but even more than history, uh, what's your name? Yeah. What? I think like also have a bank of Lou, okay. Lou, why why are people bound by customer history? Why do people feel so bound? It's a social thing. If, you're, if, if you do... Or the wrong thing, then you're not gonna be well liked. Ah. Some people care. A lot of people care. Good, right? So there's also social pressure, right? If you're known, I think Alex alluded to this. If you're known as the jerk who takes the beaches and takes the whales off the beach without calling the owner, people will not go on to work with you. I mean, you can't extract the oil from this by yourself. You need to go to an oil extracting. I don't know what that would be. But I'm sure you need someone else's help. And if you get the reputation of being, you know, a jerk, you're going to have be, you know, ostracized. You're going to be an outcast in your own community, right? So there's a small, I'm guessing there's a relatively finite group of people who deal with whale oil. I'm guessing it's a very big trade. And people know each other, right? This is just as applicable to you as lawyers, right? I'm positive at some point in your law school career, you can have the opportunity to screw over one of your neighbors for the advantage of yourself, right? I mean, the, the classic story, which I don't think has ever actually happened, is that someone hides the book in the library that everyone needs, right? We, we heard the story. I don't know if it's true. This happened to me in law school, though. Once there was a legal writing assignment due at a certain time, 10 minutes before the fire alarm was pulled in the school. And everyone had to evacuate the building and everything. I never found out who did it, uh, but if I had to suspect someone was running late in their deadline, I was like, I got an idea. So I think the lesson to be learned here is don't be a jerk because people remember that kind of stuff. I mean, if that person had been discovered, he would have been in a lot of trouble. All right, so we have we have this idea of custom, or history, or however you want to call it, or usage, right? And the people in that area of Massachusetts knew that if a whale washes ashore, you call the owner and you try and find out who owns it, right? Comply with custom. Don't get reputations as a jerk. And I don't know, maybe one day you'll hunt a whale, and your whale will wash up on shore, and you hope someone might do give you the same courtesy, right? The point to stress, though, is imagine this. In our modern regulatory state, people comply with the law without a statute. Whoa, right? People can actually self-regulate through spontaneous order. They can divide rules for themselves that they actually comply with and that just everyone sticks with. And you have this rare jerk, for example, in this case, who stole the whale, but this was probably a custom that gone on for years. This is similar to Indians put the brands on the trees. Remember in the case last week? They put the markings, the crescents, on the different trees. They said, okay, you know what? I'm going to hunt here, you're going to hunt there, and we're going to you know, share the woods in the wilderness. So groups can come to private arrangements and arrange things themselves to optimize property values. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, so that's what's supposed to happen in Massachusetts whaling country. Uh, but that isn't what happened here. Uh, sir, what's your name? 
Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan, so what happened here? What, what were the facts uh, of this case, the short case? You got it? Yeah, they didn't. Yeah. What? You got it? No. No. Okay. If you don't have it, tell me. Don't don't waste the time. So what's your name? Calvin. 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 What happened here? What are the facts? Yeah, the they bomb lanced the whale. Okay. And watched the punch shore. Uh huh. The other person found it. Uh huh. When he found it, he sold it. Ah, he didn't tell them, right? Right. He sold it. Uh huh. And they sued him. Okay. Good. All right. So this is a case where the natural ordering didn't work out, right? The natural agreements. Everyone in this town had this custom, right? When you find a whale, you call, you know, you call the person whose brand you find. But this guy was a jerk and didn't. But he got caught, right? This wasn't like the fire alarm in law school. He got caught. Someone found out, which is probably not too hard. Look at the size of these things. I mean, they're, they're really big. I think it would be pretty hard to, like, <laughs> drag one of these, like, shh, don't tell anyone, right? <laughs> It's like the world's worst thief. You steal a whale, right? You know, like a free willy or something. This is a bad idea. You remember the movie Free Willy? That was a weird movie. I don't. I did it, but the whale actually got one free, right? So we went to the Sea World in San Antonio. It's pretty bad. I, not even that sad. I mean, I was not impressed. Like I remember being much more interesting when I was younger. It was pretty lame. I, I don't know. This wasn't interesting, but um, anyway. So free willies. So yeah, smuggling a whale is not a very good idea. It, it's it's easy to do. These are big, big, big animals. Okay. So uh, the, the, the hunter discovered that this jerk sold it, and uh, he filed a lawsuit. Uh, so what's your name? Marcel. Marcel. Did, what did he sue for? Did he sue for uh, money, damages? Did he want the whale back? What, what, what did he try and get? Uh, I don't know. You don't have it? Yeah, I don't have it. Okay. What did he try and sue for? What's the your value name? Of the, Nick. Nick, what did he try and sue for? Uh, the value of the whale? Or... Exactly, right. He tried to sue for the value of the whale, right? So he didn't actually want, you know, the whale back because the whale had already been tried. He tried to get damages for the amount of the whale. Okay. So the court had to resolve this question, and we discussed it before. But um, so what's your name? Carson. Carson. Right. Carson. So were there any um, statutes or precedents or like at any any we might call positive law, any kind of statutes governing this? There's no statutes or anything like that. There was a historical perspective and. Ah. Okay. So, what was the uh, what was the general historical practice then the court looked to? Uh, the the rich guy tried to argue that it's kind of like a fine first discovery type, but then mm -hmm. first in time first mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the court said that the historical practice was to look for the bomb and the plumber and then to apply to whoever whoever's way it was. Okay. So the argument for the hunter was like, listen. I put all this work into hunting this whale, right? I even got my bomb lance into it. Okay. Is that enough? So did I call everyone? Did the entire class? All right, back up top. So what's your name? Uh, Warren. Warren? Warren. Oh, Juan. Okay, Juan. Um, so the argument for the uh, hunter is that, you know, I put all this labor into it, and I threw my harpoon into it, right? Yeah. Is throwing the harpoon into the whale capturing it? I mean, I'm saying that we won't be able to put in the effort to capture it, but at the end of the day... Is it actually capturing it? Um, I would say yes, because you're putting, I mean, you're actually making the intention to capture the animal. But, but you know, you know, retain position of... Okay, animal. so let me, let me ask you a slightly different question. Say they fire the harpoon, and it just grazed his skin. Like, it didn't go in, it just grazed it, but it made it bleed. Would that be capturing it? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so, as long as it doesn't make a decision. Okay, so what's your name? Mario. Mario, how much contact do you think is necessary to actually capture a huge whale? Well, Mario, what happens if you know they fire the bomb lance, hit the whale, but say it didn't like in the tail or something, it didn't kill him, the whale just swam away? Would that be enough to say he captured it? No. Why not? It's, 
Okay, so what amount of contact is necessary that is actually considered being captured? <laughs> what would you say? I'd say uh, once animal is killed. Mortal wound. Okay, I think that's on the right track, right? When we talk about the rule of capture of wild animals, right, we're not just talking about placing your hand on it, right? Because imagine you're chasing a fox, asking, what are you saying, right? And, and you put your hand on the fox, and he gets away. Have you captured the fox? No. You touched it, right? It was in your hands, and that wily fox, yip, 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 right? He ran away. Everyone knows what the fox say? Okay, we'll watch on Monday. Okay. The mere act of touching it is not enough, right? Now, let's go back to this picture we have of the whale hunt, right? Uh, so what's your name? John. John. Is it possible to actually grab the whale and like, you know, take him by hand? Right. What's the only way that man can actually make some sort of contact with these with these huge animals? Stick. Okay. Right? So it's not enough to shoot them and have the you know harpoon bounce off their skin. Because I mean they have very thick skin, right? You know, like all lawyers, right? They have thick skin. So you actually have to be able to penetrate and actually strike a wound. But not just any wound, as I think Mario said a second ago, it's gotta be a kill shot, right? A mortal, a mortal blow that actually resulted in killing the animal. Sorry. What if you shoot multiple times and he bleeds out? Ah, uh, you were gonna be my next question. Yeah, go for it. Sorry. That's okay. I was wondering How do you know your your shot hit him? Yeah. Okay, let's let's do another one. Say they were two different companies, right? Two different whaling companies. Person A fires a harpoon there. Person B fires a harpoon there. They both get struck. Well, are they like tags harpoons? Like, yeah, they each have their own tags on them. How do you know which was a kill shot? Uh, I guess closer to the heart, if they know where the heart is. Or like, it's like you know, eight by one team and one by another. Yeah. Is that where the Ah. Okay. So. Oh, hands, please, yeah. Sorry. Say there are both shots to the head, or both shots to the chest. All right, so there, there was no, like, CSI, like, wailing, right? There wasn't, like, <laughs> they didn't have, like, autopsy to figure out. But this is actually, didn't you have this question in torts, like, if two people shoot the person at the same time, who's liable? Or in crim law, like, if, like, you know, there are two bullets and they both happen to the person, what was, like, the intervening cause? Yeah, I mean, there are different doctrines you can have. Uh, uh, but I think, from a proper perspective, <laughs> You'd say, who threw the harpoon first, right? Can we actually establish, well, this boat was snapped in half, right? And this boat was kind of closer. You would probably give it to them. But I think when you talk about the actual harpoon, it has to be a kill shot, right? It has to be actually stuck in the animal. Now, if the animal bleeds out, that's a kill shot, right? If you, if you shoot a, a game, like you're hunting, you shoot it, and you don't kill it right away, but it bleeds out, that's your, that's your kill. Well, I'll just ask, because like, let's say there's, like you said, the two are chasing it. Uh, so they shoot at the same time, and they're still both chasing it. It's your law student, right? <laughs> I don't know, right? A court would probably say, you know, which I don't know. You tell me. If you're a judge, how would you handle that? I, I'm just asking. No, I'm asking you now. Oh, okay. Get, based on what we've learned, we I mean, we have what like like 90 minutes of property left. Like, what are the different ways a court could resolve it? Think about it. I mean, so if you don't have a trial. First. Uh huh. The what, most shots. The same amount of shots. What, um, what are the what are the different principles? First what are the different principles that the judges try to consider in this case? They're right here. You don't have to look at your notes. Um, well, this capture rule. Uh -huh. But they're both there. So. Okay. So. So like, I guess whoever touches it first. Or. I mean, what's the shoot the like? Just put on to the next it? line. Oh. Oh. Who did the most labor? Yes. What if perhaps one boat was chasing it longer and cornered it, and the other boat kind of swooped in the last minute, it was a jerk, and threw its harpoon? Ah, this, this is actually the issue of Pearson to be posed for Monday. This is a Fox case. Okay? And yeah, this would be a question for a jury to answer that one. Uh, uh, this, this would not be a question of law, so we're not so concerned here, but, but your hypothetical is well taken. All right? But I think the point we made is you need to get a kill shot where the harpoon actually sticks in, right? And I think some of the cases discuss is if you throw the harpoon, and it doesn't stick in, and the harpoon comes out, is it still yours, right? So what's your name, sir? Tamron. What happens if, you know, say the harpoon gets thrown in, the whale washes it ashore, but the harpoon's gone. All you see is the, the mark of the harpoon. Is that enough? 
Well, even if we don't know that the uh, harpoon actually killed him, what if he just died of old age? <laughs> the whale got, got the wound some years ago and washed ashore. There's no, there's no, right. So, so, so these, are, these are not impractical questions, but they, they are difficult. So the court has to basically issue some sort of rule of decision, right? And they look at a couple different ways, okay? Uh, they, they discuss this idea of, you know, did the iron actually get in, right? The, the word is fastened, right? Was the whale fastened to the boat by, uh, let me show you the picture again. You can't, you can kind of see there, see there's like a rope, this little thing right there. Kind of see it, not a very good picture. Was the whale fastened to the boat? Okay. Okay. So say no one got the hook in line, right? It wasn't fastened. You could also ask, who was the first one to put the harpoon in the body? Right? Who was the first one to actually get the harpoon with a kill shot? What's one other thing, and I'm going back to my friend's question here. Say you can't decide. Say they both threw the spear at the exact same time. So which name? Harrison. Harrison. They both threw the spear at the exact same time. They looked at their watches and everything. I mean, this is 50-50, right? Who gets the whale? Uh, it's found on shore by a good Samaritan with no interest in it. The, the only competing claim is between two hunters, and they, I mean, they spear the whale at the exact same time, and they've been chasing for this. They, they were chasing at the same time also. What's more resolving this? Yes. 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 Say it again. They split it. The whale has a dollar value, right? Split it in half. Uh, everyone remember Barry Bonds, who was a baseball player a number of years ago, um, and at the first time he was quite popular. He actually broke a Hank Aaron's record for most home, most home runs. And his final, the, the ball that broke the record, he hit a home run. You know, and once he hits a home run, I mean, it's anyone's game. And you actually have this, this melee, right, in the stands, where you can see it on video put up on YouTube. One guy got it, and then everyone mobbed him. So the ball jumps out of the guy's hand, and this other guy gets it and like, goes like this. And he's like, he's, he's covering the ball. And they basically remove him from the stadium of security, right? So there's a question. Who gets to keep the ball? The guy who actually first caught it, and then, you know, the guy was bum-rushed. The, the ball flew out of his hand. Or the guy who actually secured possession of it. And this was, this was a court case in California like five, six years ago that wasn't too different than the whale case. So what's your name? Andrew, okay. What you're, you're Judge Andrew? What do you do here? Um, I mean, I would have to say the guy that was bum rushed was not exactly like typical conduct. Uh huh. I mean, it, it's uh, an extenuating circumstance, I guess. Maybe. And and I should make clear, the guy who bum rushed, he didn't actually secure possession. Like it was in his hands, but he didn't he didn't make the catch. What's your name? Aaron. Aaron, what do you think? Uh, uh, my instinct says the receiver has to have full possession of the ball. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, incomplete, incomplete catch. So the guy. So that's like there's an interception, it's hip, and then the guy catches it. Right. 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 So his feet were in bounds. Right. So okay. So even there, we have two two law students, two judges of different perceptions. One guy said the person who got it first gets not fair. He was by chance positioned in the right spot. The ball came right to him, and then these other jerks knocked him out of the way. And then the, the other one said. No, you get the person who secures possession. But what's the third way? So what's your name? Jordan, what's, what's the third way of resolving it? <laughs> Barry Bonds. Well, well, actually, let's make that point. Was it still Barry Bonds' property? Once he hit it, it was no longer the property of Major League Baseball. This, you'll do this later, but it's called abandonment, right? Once Barry Bonds hit it, it was out in the open. Right? Now, what's your name? Alex, what's one other way of resolving this? Forget, forget Barry Bonds, his big head and all. Yes, Solomon, right? Solomon the wise. You sell the ball, you split the proceeds in half, you have half to the first guy, half to the second guy. Isn't that fair? No. No? <laughs> Who says no? It's my ball. Your ball. Well, what's funny is what actually happened. What actually happened in this case is... Um, well, first of all, Barry Bonds was a very popular player, but he had allegations of steroids, right? In the intervening time from when he hit the home run to when they actually put up for auction, Barry Bonds got a lot less popular. And the value of the ball 
dwindled a lot. It didn't sell for nearly as much as expected. Even worse, the lawyer's fees for these two guys <laughs> exceeded the amount of money they got at auction. They both took a loss. They both lost money because they spent so much money fighting over this ball with the lawyers that by the time it went for auction, it didn't sell for nearly enough, and they had to cut that in half. So your lesson is, lawyers get all the money. <laughs> Barry Bonds got zipped. The two people, the balls got zipped, and the lawyers got their bills paid, I think. I don't know. Uh, but, and also, there were serious tax implications, too, because that ball, you hit it, the IRS is saying earned income if you haven't sold it yet. It's a weird deal because it's effectively, you've gained something of great value. And I'm sure they assessed the taxes based on whatever they thought the, the ball was worth as an initial. And this went on for like two or three years. And it was funny, the judge in California actually appointed a commission of like property professors to come in and like explain how to resolve this. And they were signing like the whale case. They were signing the fox case. I mean, these things are actually salient 200 something years later. Anyway, so uh, yes, one, one resolution would be to simply split the value of the whale in half. And that, that would probably be the Maybe the most fair, I don't know, but it, it, it would it, it would at least make both of them partially happy. So that's not what the court did here. Now, yeah, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda, what what's what did the court do in this case? They No, who who got it? Who got the who got the money? Uh, okay, the plaintiff got it, right? The original hunter got it. Okay. Why did they rule for the hunter? What was, what was the court's reasoning, the, the original hunter? Um, because he was the one, I mean, it's based on the usage of custom. Okay. Okay. So, but let's be very precise. The, the custom was you would return the whale, right? But that wasn't the entirety of the ruling. So what's your name? Jared. Jared? Jared. Jared. Chad, what was what was what was the reasoning behind it? It wasn't just custom. What was of, of these two principles, right? Yeah, I would say both of them. Okay, but, but was it? Let's think about it. What actually did the court say about how the whale was captured? What was significant? What was the key deciding factor? What was the labor? I guess so. First to do what? Yes. They were the first to capture the whale. Right? Although they talked a lot about custom, right? That wasn't what actually resolved the case. What resolved the case was that they were first in time, right? Their harpoon did the kill shot. Right? They got the kill shot in first. They they, they lanced it with the bomb. And the marking was there to prove it. So that was the basis. That was the basis for the court's resolution. Even though the, the line didn't stay, right? Remember I mentioned there's this picture, I'll show it again, where you can actually strike a line, right? Even though the line wasn't there, the court considered with this whale, the best you can do is strike with a harpoon and hope for a kill shot. Everyone see that? So that, this was really, even though it might seem like a labor case, this was really a rule of capture case, right? Even though the jerk got the whale himself, he physically captured it and dragged it to get the oil, it was the harpoon that made contact first and was fatal contact, right? It was a fatal attraction of some sort. Go and see that. Okay. Questions? All right, so, sir. If I can ask, this was a judge sitting in a federal court in Massachusetts. What power did he have to resolve this case based on the rule of first in time? Where did he, where did he get this this law from? What, where, where, where did this law come from? He started a couple of other cases. Other cases, good. Where did those other cases get their law from? This is gonna be a circle quickly. The custom and usage at the time. Okay. Yes. Right. So here's where custom and usage comes into play, right? The court resolved it based on the principle of capture, right? Who got there first? But where does this principle of capture come from? Customs. It was the custom 
of the whalers in this area to rely and capture. So the judge adopted that custom as well, right? So I, so I can say it like this. The, the, the legal principle, right, was the rule of capture. But that principle comes from custom. That makes sense, right? The court looked to the custom of the time, how the hunters uh, uh, operated. Okay. So that's why all the cases he cited came from different places. So I think one came from Alaska, and one came from somewhere else. And there are different whaling customs. Like in some places, you actually have to keep the line in, right? Some judges said you have to keep the line in. So that's the custom they used. Other judges said, no, you don't need to keep the line in as long as you make impact. Okay? Questions? All right. So there's a question here. It says, uh, is the first in time more important than the amount of effort or the equal? So are you asking me or are you asking the courts, right? In my mind, I think they're equally important. But the courts have, yes, ah, smart, one, smart guy, right? But if you ask the courts, they prefer the first in time rule, okay? But I'm going to ask why. So, sir, what's your name? Oh, Ravi. Ravi. Why, why do you think courts prefer the first in time doctrine over the, la over the labor efficiency doctrine? It's probably easier to Yes. Say the greatest advantage of the rule of capture the biggest advantage of the first in time rule is that it's easy. Right, Ravi, why is it easy to apply here? I mean, it's pretty clear, other than the circumstances, they both shoot the rule at the same time, and that it's pretty clear that there's the original person who started the Right. So, so, right, so imagine, imagine the circumstance we had before, right? You have these two whaling boats, right? And they're both chasing it. And we don't know how long they've been chasing it for, right? One gets a kill shot, the other misses, right? They both throw the harpoons at the same time. One hits it, one misses. Okay? Okay, so sir, what's your name? Gary. Gary. Okay, so you, you're the lawyer for the guy who threw the harpoon and missed. What's your argument? He threw the harpoon and missed, but what, 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 what are you going to argue? Probably effort. Good. But, yeah, what's your argument? I mean, lawyer. Okay, so he's putting in effort to get everything done. Yes. So he shoots it to make contact. Unfortunately, his aim was off, but... Uh, so, so what are you going to argue? Who did more effort, you or the other guy who actually hit him? What do you think? You. Okay. So the person who missed it is going to argue, oh, yeah, look how much effort I put into it, right? Now, I'm sure Gary's a fine lawyer, but why do we believe him, right? How do we know how much effort was put into this hunt? Usually, whalers don't keep very good records in these kinds of things, right? There's no video, right? But, man, what's your name? Summer. But what do we know for sure? What's the easiest proof we have in this case? The, the, the most in, indisputable proof we have. Yes, that there's a whale that was killed with that brand. You can bring that brand, you can bring the harpoon to court as evidence. Okay? Judges like certainty. Judges like things that are easy to prove. If you try and prove who put more labor in, X or Y, that's not an easy question. I mean, that's a tricky question of fact that, that you're not going to resolve very well. But if the question is, who captured it first, right? Who hit the kill shot? Whose harpoon is buried in the whale? Okay, that's an easy question. You bring in the harpoon to court. It's like, oh, yep, judgment for you. Case over. This was not a long opinion. It was only a few pages long. It didn't take the court very long to reach its conclusion. And common law judges like easiness. Now, there's a downside. How much your name? Meredith. What's the downside to this rule of capture analysis? What's the downside to giving it to the, um, uh, to the person who actually strikes it from Gary's fine client who spent all this time chasing it? What's, what's, the, what's the major downside there? I guess it would kind of discourage work. Good. people just to get things they didn't work for. Yeah, it ain't fair, right? It's not fair. So if you're rewarding labor, it's more about fairness. If you're doing the first in time rule, it's more about certainty, right? First in time rule is very certain. It's easy. You have the body there, you have the harpoon, there's no there's no dispute. But with the labor issue, it's not fair, right? You're not giving to the guy who worked harder. Right? 
She also made another point about encouraging efficiency, right? So, and what's your name? Adriana. So say say you're Gary's client, right? And you just spent all this time hunting the whale, and this idiot judge gave it to the other guy. Will you have as much incentive to go out and hunt whales again? Why not? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've had this happen in your life, where you spend a lot of time doing something, you get nothing out of it. You're like, screw that, not doing that again, right? Well, people respond to incentives. We are humans. We respond to incentives. If a court structures the incentives and the legal structure that it rewards the juror, throws a harpoon accurately, and not the person who invested all this time, then maybe people won't spend as much time hunting. Right? So, now what's your name? Yeah. Samantha. How do you think the whalers in uh, uh, Massachusetts reacted to this judgment? Do you think they were happy or sad? Why were they happy? Okay, good. So, so as a custom developed, do you think they prefer the labor model, or the first in time rule? At, exactly. The custom that they developed, the people themselves developed the custom, was based on first in time. So here. The people wanted a first in time rule. They consider that more fair. Even, even if it might discourage some hunting at the margins, they want something else easy to apply. Okay? Everyone see that? Okay. All right. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I know we haven't covered this case of Pearson versus Paul. We'll do that on Monday, yep. Okay, but I have a question related to that. Like, sure. That's a very famous case. Why doesn't this one apply to this case? Kind of was uh, going through analysis, I know, because when uh, the, the two hunters that died in the sun when they shot the, the fox, uh, they didn't have the intention. Is it because of the intention? Or well, let's do Pearson on Monday. Oh, okay. This case, this case was decided about 80 years after Pearson. So that's. Uh, uh, Oh, Pearson was 1804, 1805. This is like an 1870 or something case. So, I mean, this is decided much later. But Pearson does cite the next case we discussed, the Duck case. Uh, well, well, I promise. We'll do, we'll do Pearson on Monday. I'm glad you think it's famous. It's one of my favorite cases. I love it. Okay. Uh, uh, another question. I guess A is our, our, our premium here. Uh, <laughs> what, what if you've got one party putting in more effort, like objectively more, and the other person just kills them? What it? That question on Monday. This is the question uh, which uh, Juan, right? Yes, sir. This is the question Juan was getting at. When you have one guy who puts in all the effort for the hunt and you have one jerk, what happens then? That that's our question for Monday. Okay, I promise we'll get back there. The preview is the jerk wins, as as is often the case. All right, other questions. All right. What do you mean optimistic? Well, what, which one do you think is more fair? Giving it to the jerk, uh, giving it to the hunter, or giving it to the jerk? Give it to the hunter, right? Ah. What do you think? Well, yeah. Well, in this is in this case, the person who ended up with the whale did nothing. To get, I mean, he wasn't even the finder because the yeah. finder sold the whale. So this is an easier case. Yeah, exactly. It's not. The, it's not what we think. Yeah, this is an easier case because the guy who found the whale and sold it had no claim to it. Yeah. The harder case is on Monday when you have two competing hunters. So we'll come back to that Monday, okay? All right. Before you go on, one. Uh, okay, that's good. All right. Any other questions in this case? We move on to the duck case. All right, let's see the duck case. Anyone ever go duck hunting? Not not Nintendo. Uh, yeah, I've never I've never been duck hunting. I actually Google this. Does anyone want to explain what a duck decoy is? Go for it. Uh, well, back in those days, there were actually like a wood that was painted like a male mallard, um, but now they're just little plastic, like fake ones. Have ones that you can stick in like the marsh that actually have like flapping wings. Mm-hmm. It's called Mojo, but yeah. I had actually never heard of Duck Dynasty until I taught this case, and I was like, and then it came back, hit me again last year. So let me show you a video of how this works. This is actually the video is in Dutch, so maybe you speak Dutch, you can translate from it, which I know. 
de pijp zei, komt de koeiker achter ze tevoorschijn. De verschrikte vogels vliegen dan aan het eind van de right, pijp en vangen hen. De, de, de ducks fly in. De koeiker komt dan snel aangelopen en slaat het vanghokje af. Then the guy drops the door and traps him in that tube. Deze in de koeiker. En dan kan hij take the duck out. Okay. Zoals in de andere koop. Alright, everyone get that? So the general gist is, they would build these, um, these mesh nets. And they would usually have a dog or something scare the duck into flying into these tubey thingies, right? And then once they're in the tubey thingies, they would then get stuck. So I understand this is a very easy way of uh, hunting ducks. Not, not quite as easy as Nintendo duck hunt, but, but in the ballpark. So everyone get the general gist of how they uh, work. And this is a diagram in the book which I find absolutely early unhelpful. But are, these are the netty thingies. So they have the main lake in the middle. And they try and drive the ducks into the corners where they can then, you know, snatch them off. Everyone, everyone get that? Yeah? Okay. And in case you're interested, um, this is a drawing of Mr. Edmund Hickeringill. Uh, this was the other jerk. There's always a jerk in these cases, for whatever reason. Uh, he was the jerk. He looks like a jerk, uh, doesn't he? And this was the, the judge uh, who decided this is uh, Lord Chief Justice Holt, who was a very prominent British judge, issued a lot of important opinions. Uh, among them, he issued the opinion which found that there could be no slavery in England. He had this great line that said, uh, uh, the second a person breathes English air, he becomes free. You know, there's this beautiful line which was actually uh, uh, repeated by abolitionists for many years. Uh, he was a very prominent judge. So he resolved this case. Okay? All right. So, and what's your name? Cassandra, tell me what happened here. Uh huh. Good, okay, that's right. So you have uh, uh, Mr. Keeble, who has a, a, a duck decoy, and um, I'm sure you can imagine when the ducks hear a loud noise, they get scared. Is that right, my friend? Yeah? Yes. They, okay, so when the ducks hear a loud noise, they get scared. So this, this SOB, right, this jerk who lives next door, uh, saunters up, wait till he's about to you know, trigger the decoy, and then fires his, you know, his rifle, and just boom. And scares all the ducks away, right? So this isn't a, this isn't really even a case where you have uh, two hunters competing for the same animal. This guy's just being a jerk, right? There's no there's no ways about it, right? So I want to give you um, two words in Latin. I always spell it wrong. Nature, nature. Okay, one second. Let me get the spell. I, I always spell this word wrong. I apologize. Uh, Ferry natre and uh, rationi soli. Okay? These are two words, which I'm probably spelling wrong, but you'll see them correctly in your book, uh, that, that express different concepts, which you'll see. Okay, the first one, fairy natre, uh, means wild animal. Right, feral is like an animal, nat is like natural. It means a wild animal. And there are very specific rules that govern wild animals. Right? This is different from a domesticated animal, right? Domesticated animals are yours, whatever. But wild animals are in nature, they can be chased. Okay? The second one is rationally solely, which literally means on your soil or on your land, if you will. So generally speaking, before we even get to any of the case law here, if an animal, a wild animal is on your land, it's yours, right? If there's a duck on your private property, then it's a wild duck. So long as it's on your property, it's yours, right? This one's easy, but the court takes a slightly more complicated analysis. We'll see this in the Pearson case, which we've asked but a couple times. There, they were hunting on a public beach. In the case of the whales, they were hunting in a, you know, the, the open ocean, so no one owned the ocean. Here, 
These were ducks that were attracted to the land. He built these pretty decoys to trap them in. So they were his as a matter of that. But the court took a slightly different approach. What's your name? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. So tell me, what did, what did the court do here? Um, well, they say that this um, landowner had the right to enjoy his property and profit. Uh -huh. And exactly. the other guy um, was malicious and violent and not trying to compete with him. So the original landowner mm -hmm. with the decoys um, had the right to those, those animals. Okay, that's exactly right. So this isn't necessarily a case about competing claims of hunters, right? I found it, I hunted. This is about something else. What can you do on your land, right? And the court says very clearly that you have the right to enjoy your land, right? You have the right to profit from your land. If this is your, your hobby or your trade or your profession is hunting of ducks, you can do this. And you can't have some jerk coming in from the side and taking it away from you. You can't have that. Okay, so what's your name? Eric. Eric. Eric, what would happen if instead of this guy being a jerk, he had his own duck decoy next door? And it was a much more attractive duck decoy, right? This is like the you know, top of the line, it's up four seasons, right? Would there be any problem there? No. Why not? He's not really going on property and hearing it's just setting up uh, competing Good. Right. So competition's okay, right? And, and actually, uh, now what's your name? Allison. Allison. They give an example of competing schools, right? What's the example they give with the competing schools? Uh, the one guy builds a new school to basically put the other one up. Okay. And is that okay? Uh, yes. 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 What would not be okay? Uh, <laughs> they give a funny example. Man bringing his horse to market to sell. Oh no, that's what I'm thinking of. Anyone know what I'm thinking of? What what would not be yeah. a? Oh, the guns. Yes, right. So it would be okay to exactly. So it would be okay to set up a competing school, but you can't sit there and blow up your gun to scare all the kids away, right? That 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 would that 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 would not be that would not be okay, right? Uh, so so this is more a case about markets than about anything else. Okay. All right. All right, any other questions on that? It's a pretty simple case. Nothing too complicated there. All right, let's, let's go back to something we talked about in class uh, uh, last time, which discusses, we, we mentioned something called the Coast Theorem, right? Uh, and I want to build on this, because this will be something we return to a lot throughout the class. So uh, before I get there, anyone, anyone from Dallas, anyone know what this is? Okay, so about a couple of years ago in Dallas, they built this huge, uh, you know, this huge glass tower near the museum district. And as a result of the museum district, I'm sorry, as a result of having this uh, a very reflective glass, when the sun hits it just right, it effectively shines a light at the garden across the street and burns all the grass. <laughs> you probably read about this, right? The angle hits it just right that the sun rays hit it, and it basically burns all the grass. Okay. As you can imagine, this is a museum with very affluent people, and they're not happy about this, right? So uh, now it's Ashley. Ashley. So what do you think the uh, the neighbors uh, who own this museum right next door said about this uh, uh, death ray, whatever you want to call it? I'm sure they were saying that uh, they're messing with their profits or they're losing profit or they're hindering their business mm -hmm. or something like that. All right. What's your name, ma'am? No, no, no. In front. Ma'am, what's your name? Please. Please. What do you think the uh, neighbors who own this museum proposed to, to resolve this situation? Deflected. Well, what do you think they initially wanted them to do? <laughs> okay, so let, let's actually consider all the options, right? So it's pretty clear that this building is causing some sort of nuisance, which was someone said before, right? It's directing a very intense form of sunlight on, on an adjacent property, such that it's destroying, it's destroying 
their land, right? Okay, so what are the possible options? One would obviously be perhaps demolition, right? Take down the entire apartment, okay? Now, what's your name? Yeah. Catherine? Catherine? What's another option? Okay, good. So one proposal was to change all the glass on the side of the building. Now, the, it's actually a funny story, but the owner of the building trolled. He took on an anonymous username and put all these comments in the different message boards saying, oh, no, that'd be too expensive. And they found out it was him, right? <laughs> so let, let's assume, let's ass I mean, I don't know if it's true or not. It probably isn't. But let's assume for a moment that it's not uh, feasible to take all the glass away. I mean, it would probably actually destroy the structure of the building. I don't even know, right? Let's say it's not feasible. All right? What's your name? Eddie. Eddie, what's, what's, what's another option that, 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 that could be done to resolve this, this property dispute? Yeah, Superman drop himself. <laughs> okay. But you're actually on the right track. So <laughs> there was a proposal to build a set of adjusting sun blocks. Everyone see Mr. Burns, like we tried to block out the sun? It's basically like this, and there's actually an animated GIF, right? You would actually have these different, uh, like, umbrellas open and close at various times of the day and season as the sun moved around to block the light. I'm not kidding. So this diagram here shows how they put a filter to block the rays uh, at various junctures, okay? Here, here's an a even better diagram. So basically... At different times of the year, it would open up these other filters, right? So, as you can imagine, the uh, the museum wasn't too crazy about having this bizarre arch thing over there, you know, these opening and closing uh, uh, thing. So, that's not an option. Okay. Maybe it is, but I don't think the things will be built, right? They're going to say, screw this, right? All right. So, at this point, our only options are demolition, and they're not going to consent to the building of the sunscreen. Now, what's your name? Sonia, Sonia, what's another option? What else could we do? Damages. Okay, what do you mean? Um, okay, good. So, what do you think is more expensive? Residing the entire building or paying for new sod and grass? More exp less expensive. Yes, right. Everyone see that, right? So if you want to try to balance the, the, the harm, right, this building probably costs a lot of money to build and put up all these glass sides, right? If I had to guess, putting in new grass and sod, a couple thousand dollars a year, 10, 20, say hundred thousand dollars a year, whatever it is, it's not very expensive. But wait a minute. And what's your name? Elizabeth. Is that fair that we let one party shine their death ray on this beautiful garden and we just let them pay for it? We let people pay to pollute? Is that, is that fair? Why not? Yeah, the death ray will shine year-round, right? So, so Jake? Jake, Jake so, so what do we do here as a society, right? This, this is a matter of common law. There's not really a uh, statute governing what? What, what should courts do in this situation when you have the, this museum who's getting their, their sod burned off every you know, week, and then you have this you know, very expensive glass tower that's charging uh, premium rents? What, what, should, what should they do here? For the museum? I'm talking about for society. You're, you're a judge. You represent the county. Uh, I guess we're part of custom regarding uh, okay. what's, what's custom in this case? I'm assuming it's too costly to move the building, it's too costly <laughs> to pay for the grass, and probably pay damage to the grass. Okay, what, what do you think? Move the museum. Move, move the museum. Oh, that, that, that'd be even tougher. All right, so let's pretend, though, and let's actually try and work this out with numbers. I know, I know people say they go to law school because they don't like math, which is just silly because there's actually a significant amount of math, which, which everyone has to do. Let's just try to, you know, make up some numbers, okay? Okay, let, let's just say that, I don't know, the building makes, you know, one, uh, the tower makes, let's say, a million dollars a year, right? I don't know, and let's say uh, the, 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 the museum, the, the damages are, say, you know, I'll be generous, say 
$50,000 a year. Right? So the tower is making a million dollars of profits per year. Right? And the museum's making 50000 Now, the museum would be for the court and demand an injunction. Right? They can say, court, we demand you to order that this glass tower stop shining its death ray. We don't care how they do it. They can move the tower. They can put a new glass siding on it. Right? But we don't want damages. We want an injunction. The museum could say that, couldn't they? Right? The museum would be well with the saying, Your Honor, we want an injunction. Stop this sunlight. Stop it. We don't care how much money it takes. And let's say that, you know, uh, let's say the, uh, the, 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 the re-siding, right? It costs $15 million, right? A large amount. Because often you'll find that it's actually more expensive to change it than to have done it in the first place like this. We'll do a case um, later this year, uh, actually that originated in Houston, and involves the noise coming from these huge air conditioning units. So you ever seen the really old AC units? They're like jet engines. They're really loud, right? And actually, there were these neighbors next door that said, this is too loud, nuisance. Well, it was actually more expensive to install a central AC system after the fact than it would have been to install in the first place normally. So it's very often really expensive to fix stuff. So. If you're the tower and they're going to the court saying we demand an injunction, right? What do you say? Pam, what's your name? Shelly. 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 What what do you say if you're the owner of this tower and the museum is about to go to court for an injunction? What what do you tell them? What, what's, what's your offer? I would say uh, tell the museum to mitigate their damages and maybe make a bird garden. I don't know. You think they're gonna like that? No, but a dirt garden, I like that. <laughs> that or what else? What else? What could you say? You know, you can't spend fifteen million dollars or bankrupt the building. Yeah. So, so what's your name? Steven. Steven, you're the owner of the tower. You have the museum. What do you say? Um, I would ask them to see if they could, if there was a way we could resolve it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Can I give you money to to make this go away? Or yeah. How How do you do that? How do you make it go away? Well, um, you. Reside, or you pay for them to put some trees yes. to, to block the sun. How about you make a proposal where we'll we'll pay you money to do all of your gardening, right? That makes sense. Ma'am, what's your name? Samantha. Samantha, what's the amount of money that the museum should be willing to consider for that offer, rationally speaking? Um. Based on what I put up here. How much does it cost them to be thought and do all that? How much does that work? Well, that, that's what the, yeah. The amount of damages, in other words, the amount of cost to fix their garden is $50,000 a year. Oh, okay. What's the amount of money the museum should, at a minimum, accept? $50,000. Okay. Everyone see that? Actually, at least, so we're talking $50,000 in a penny, right? $50,000 and one cent. Why, uh, Amanda, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda, why would the museum, why should the museum accept that that number? Why should they not? No, why, sh why, why, why should they accept the number, $50,000 in a penny? Uh, because that's a reasonable fee that would, um, that would kind of uh, mitigate their damages. It will make them whole, right? right? Mm -hmm. It would cover all their damages to repair the, the, the grass, but also they profit from it. Right now, and what's your name? Carrie. Carrie, do you think they would accept the amount of fifty thousand dollars in a penny if that if their damages are exactly fifty thousand dollars? I mean, I would think so because even if they get that amount, the building is still going to be there. They're still going to end up with dead grass. Um, so I think that it'll, it's a temporary solution to fix the problem. So what's what's the what what's their upper limit? How high should they be shooting for? Based based on the numbers up there. I would say maybe I don't, a way I guess where they could let's say the price of the tower a million dollars. The, the, the tower makes a million dollars per year, right? Makes a million dollar profit per year. 
and the damages are fifty thousand dollars year. How high should they shoot? If you're, if you're the museum, what you talk to your lawyers, what, what are you going to go for? You go for a million, right? You say, I'll tell you what, Mr. Tower, if you give us a million dollars a year, yeah, you can shine your death ray on us. That's fine. We'll we'll make our dirt garden, right? Okay. Uh, what's your name, man? Emily. Emily. Okay. So if you're the tower and they demand a million dollars a year, what do you say? Okay, right. So, so this you might think is some sort of negotiation, but it's actually a property dispute, right? How can the parties, right, reach a happy point somewhere in the middle where the museum's okay having a death ray shine on them and the tower's okay losing their profits, right? There is a happy point somewhere in the middle. Yes, sir? Enough that they can pass the price off to people that are leasing the building? Yes, okay. So we made it seem very simple, right? We were just talking the museum, negotiating with the uh, uh, tower, right? But there are a lot of people involved. There are tenants in the building. There are museum patrons who don't want a death ray shining on them when they're walking around. There are shareholders of the museums. And you have to make all these people happy, right? Trying to get an entire museum board of directors, probably some very wealthy affluent people, to buy into this deal not going to be easy. So they're not going to accept $50,000 in a penny. Throw in lawyer's fees, throw in environmental impact statements, all this other stuff, right? There are lots of costs involved with negotiating this transaction, right? We call these transaction costs, which I'm sure you've heard in other contexts, right? Transaction costs. These costs often make it possible to have these kinds of agreements. Right? While perhaps there are only two people involved, we could reach some point in the middle, these transaction costs make it very tough. Everyone get that? Okay, so believe it or not, that's the Coase theorem. Ah, you were learning, you didn't even realize it. It's, 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 it's sneaky when I do this. Let's use the words we used last time, right? Externality and internalize. Now, what's your name? Ashley. In this case, what's the, ex the negative externality in this case? Uh, well, what's causing the dead grass? Uh, yeah, the, the, the <laughs> death, right? Exactly. The sun. Uh, we can call him Mr. Sun, Mr. Golden Sun, right? So here, the negative externality is the death ray, the, the sun, right? Okay. And ma'am, what's your name? Rhiannon. Rhiannon. Who's internalizing that cost? Yes. And how are they internalizing that cost? The dead grass. Okay. So, right, so we have this negative externality from the, from the tower, which is the, uh, uh, the, the, the death ray, the sun, if you will. And who is internalizing that externality? The museum with their, with their dead grass. Okay. So the way to make this okay, externalities are bad, but they're not, not so evil, is to shift the cost, right? And so what's your name? Michael. Michael. How do we shift the cost? How do we make it that the museum is no longer internalizing this? By giving damages to the point where everyone that's on their side would be pleased. Exactly. The damages shift the costs. Because once the tower pays greater than $50,000, the tower's internalizing the cost. The tower is actually internalizing the cost. The museum is not on the hook for a penny. All the museum's damages are covered. This is a very efficient bargain. It would be absolutely idiotic to have to tear down the building and move it. It would also be inefficient for everyone to have to do this reciting because then that's a lot of money that's lost. But now, the museum can actually make a profit because their grass is getting burned. They can go buy a new exhibit or lower admission prices, or I don't know. But now, the museum's actually better off because they're getting their grass burned. And you know what? The museum's better off because they don't have to reside their entire building. Everyone wins in this kind of situation. The worst thing to do here will be to get an injunction ordering them to demolish the building. Right? The worst thing to do is to get them an injunction to reside the entire building because everyone will be worse off. 
Imagine that without, right? Without courts, the people reached a conclusion. They were able to balance out these externalities, and everyone's better off. Imagine that. Everyone see that? Okay. This is the Coase theorem. I realize I can't summarize in one sentence for you, so I won't try. But this idea of balancing out the costs and these externalities in an efficient manner is a good thing. Okay? Any questions? Okay. But there's one limitation on the Coase theorem. The limitation is you assume no transaction costs. We did this also, right? Why do we do that? It can be very difficult, as we said, to get everyone on board, get all the tenants to agree to this, get all the members of the board of directors of the museum to agree to this, get all the lawyers to agree to this. All these other things jack up the costs. So I'm sure, even if, say, the museum was offered, say, half a million dollars a year, $500,000 a year, this is 10 times your damages. I guarantee that there'll be members of the museum who say, nah, we don't want a death rate, tear down the building. Principle, right? <laughs> Whatever. I guarantee that'll happen, because this happens all the time. Even though the museum could be making $450,000 extra than they wouldn't have otherwise, they'll still want to tear it down. There are bargaining disputes. People might not agree. These are what we call transaction costs. And when they're transaction costs, the, the Coase theorem doesn't work very well. At that point, you very well may go to court and get an injunction and tear down the, t tear down the tower or make them recite it. Questions? Yes, sir. Does, this, does the Coase theorem have a good predictability as far as the situation? Because it seems like the transaction cost would be pretty prevalent in every situation, in most situations. So then, what would be the point of having the It works pretty well. Okay, I'm I'm giving very extreme numbers, but it does help predict a lot of cases, even the transaction costs are low, right? In certain situations, we have very high transaction costs. It doesn't work quite as well. But there have been so Ronald Coase, who wrote this article in the 1960s, it's the most cited article in law ever. It's been cited thousands of times. This is very influential stuff. Okay. I saw a hand stuff there. Okay. Okay, so I saw that one. Why not just pay for the museum's damages, right? Why do they deserve to the profit at the loss? Well, the thing is, if it goes to court, a court very well may order an injunction and damages, both. The benefit is you negotiate out of court, and then you reach a situation where everyone's better off, and you don't get the injunction. The injunction would be the worst thing. Other questions? All right, now let me give you another example that also happened um, in uh, uh, South Beach, Florida, if anyone knows, uh, anyone's ever been there. Don't know about the Fountain Blue Hotel? Yeah, last year some guy was like, that's where Kardashians stay. All right, whatever. Um, it happened last semester. So in South Florida, in Miami, you have these two hotels. You have the, uh, the Fountain Blue and you have the Eden Rock. And these hotels were roughly the same size originally. But the um, owner of the Fountain Blue wanted to build up, increase the size of the tower. Okay? As a result of this, it would cast a shadow on the hotel next door. Now, many of you have been to Miami, you know you go there for the sun, as it's a sunshine state. And you might imagine they wouldn't like to have a shadow blocking them. This is the exact opposite problem of Dallas. In Dallas, there was too much sun. Here, there's not going to be uh, enough sun. There's nowhere to go tanning, right? So you actually have the situation where uh, the Eden Rock sought to have an injunction to stop the construction of this tower. And the numbers are basically exactly the same. Say that... Fountain Blue stands to make a million dollars more per year for building this tower. And say Eden Rock would maybe lose $50,000. You can get whatever number. Although at first blush it may seem better to, yeah, stop them from building this tower, it could very well be the case that it would make more sense for Fountain Blue to just pay them for the shade. 
right? So yes, we realize you're going to lose some profits because of this shade. We'll pay you for it. Then both parties would actually be better off. In this case, an injunction would be the worst thing, right? But it gets trickier, right? Because imagine instead of there just being one hotel next door, there are five hotels next door. Oh. And all five of these hotels would be losing sunshine and be losing profits. So you can imagine how these negotiations would go. The first hotel will say, yeah, you know what, give me $50,000, right? And the second hotel will say, yeah, yeah, $50,000 is fine. By the time you get to the third, fourth, and fifth hotel, what's going to happen? They're going to start raising the prices, right? The last hotel is going to charge the most money, right? Because say Fountain Blue's bought off the four hotels, right? And there's one left, they're going to charge a lot of money. This is what we might call a holdout, okay? Holdout problem. And this often comes up. So this is actually a key limitation as well on this kind of negotiation screen. We want to call, uh, if you want to use big Kosian uh, negotiation. Actually, Kos died last year. He was 100, 90 something years old. He's still teaching at like 90 something. It's crazy. He wrote a book like in his 95th year or something. It's, it was remarkable. But he died last year while I was teaching this. So you have this holdout problem where the last person will charge the most. Okay? That's why, to answer your question, the Coase theorem doesn't always work out this well. But it is a helpful tool to illustrate how these competing externalities uh, work. Okay. All right, so questions? Yes, sir. In that example, wouldn't it still be better for them to get the injunction because they're competitors? Ah, so that's a cost, though, right? Isn't it? The cost is not just $50,000 a year for losing uh, the shade. The cost will also be lost profits because now there's a better hotel next door. Right? Yeah. So as a matter of fierce business, it probably would be better to get the injunction. Unless they reach some deal, they could be compensated adequately. Okay. Now, why, why am I explaining this to you? Why, why am I teaching you this, this theorem from this guy named Coase? Right? This is effectively how these judges at common law decide the cases, right? How did, how did the, the court decide the, the whale case, right? I mean, he said, well, we want to reward the person who got there first, we want to reward efficiency, or do we want to split the whale in half and make things equal? We'll do the case on Monday, which is called Pearson v. Post, right? Do we want to focus on certainty? Do we want to actually promote efficiency? To create a structure where everyone benefits, where there are more whales being hunted, okay? So the, the, these theories of economics were developed hundreds of years ago by judges. The same types of theories that economists think about today, judges develop naturally in the common law. It's remarkable when you think about the common law uh, working itself pure over hundreds of years. They arrive at these exact same uh, uh, answers. Okay? Questions? This is awesome. All right, so the class on Monday is going to be a little bit different. So there are two things for reading, right? First, the case of Juan Mench was Pearson v. Post. Okay, so you have to read that case. It's not very long, but it'll probably take you a while to read it. It's a little bit of a tough read. Okay? Uh, the, the, the other thing that I want you to read is something a little bit different. It's called The Case of the Splunkian Explorers. Okay? It's a fictional article where you have in the future who are trapped in the cave and they can't be rescued. And, I'm not giving anything away, they resort to cannibalism. Okay? The reason why I want you to read this case is not because of cannibalism or criminal law. That's not so much my focus. My focus is the, the decision has opinions from five different justices. They're fake. But they illustrate different ways of resolving judicial opinions. And I promise you, every single case you'll read in law school will fit into one of these five themes. That's why it's such a popular article. Uh, and specifically, I want you to think about which justice you agree with most. And you know, make it make someone your notes. And I'll, I'll ask when you come to class on Monday, which justice speaks to you the most? Because I think you'll find that uh, uh, Pierce may post, in other words, decide on certain archetypes, or if you will, or or approaches to judging. And this will be a very good introduction to this. Okay. Any other questions? Have a great day. See you all on Monday.